I guess what I was hoping to cover was um, I sort of picked a number of topics that I think are relevant to what your interests are in this workshop. I know a limited amount about uh, machine learning, deep learning, and, and other areas of, uh, uh, you know, to do with the general area, area of learning from data. Um, so I'm somewhat familiar with some of the tools that you need, um, but, uh, and I'm going to address some of them here, but there are going to be areas that I don't address very well. For example, non-convexity is very important in, in deep learning, and I won't have too much to say about that. Um, it's a very difficult area, and it requires a lot of knowledge of the of the model and uh, a lot of experience. But still, <clears throat> I think even the tools that I do talk about, which are mostly in the convex area, um, are going to be relevant. And uh, particularly, I'm sort of focusing a lot of the algorithmic tools. And algorithmic tools for, for which we can prove certain things about, rates of convergence, convergence properties, and so on. So um, I'll make a few introductory remarks. I gave a talk to a very different audience a couple of weeks ago where I sort of had to explain a little bit about you know, the very fundamental idea of machine learning and how optimization relates to that. So I thought I'd sort of throw those slides at you. Um, might generate some discussion, some argument, whatever. We'll see what you think. Um, but uh, that's just by way of sort of setting the scene. Um, then hopefully before lunch, I can cover stuff about gradient methods, where you've got a function you're trying to minimize, and you can evaluate its gradient. Okay. Exactly, we'll assume. But I'll sort of keep an eye in discussing those methods. I'll keep an eye on methods also that can be extended to cases where you can only get estimates of the gradient and so on. Then in the session after lunch, I'll talk a little bit about stochastic gradient, which has been a class of methods that has been very popular in this community, probably increasingly so in the last few years. Um, and I'll have a lot to say about that. Um, and, and I'll say including something about parallel versions of these methods which have been showing quite a bit of promise. Then tomorrow I'll, I'll uh, cover these remaining topics, the idea of sparsity and regularization. I think that's come up a lot in the talks, even this morning, and Bengio's talks, and certainly last week. Um, uh, I'll say something about decomposition methods, where you only want to work on a subset of the variables at a time. Very powerful idea when you're dealing with huge numbers of variables, that you might want to fix some of them and just sort of optimize over a subspace. What can you prove about those things? How can you do them in parallel and so on? And then the last topic I'll talk about tomorrow will be augmented Lagrangian methods and splitting type methods. And again, these have come back as a very old class of methods in optimization, but have burst back into prominence, partly motivated by interesting applications in machine learning. OK, so here is the sort of scene setting stuff. And this stuff, I think, is um, probably very familiar to most of you but not so familiar to a lot of people in optimization. So I thought I'd, I'd show you, uh, you know, what I told sort of a mixed audience earlier. So the idea that you're trying to, uh, what you're essentially trying to do in a learning problem is, is learning from data, learning how to make inferences based on a set of data that, that you're given or that you know something about. So a typical setup is you've got a bunch of training data, you want to learn from the training data uh, enough to be able to make inferences about future data that you're presented with. So very often there's some sort of parameterized model that you're building up. Either you're either learning it or you're presented with a model and you just have to learn the parameters or whatever. There's a tremendous amount of variety across machine learning in the nature of this part of the setup. But in principle you can learn something about the model. You can fill in the blanks in that model using the tra training data and possibly using some prior knowledge that you have about how things should work or how you want things to work. And a very important ingredient from an optimization point of view is that you want some measure of how well you're doing. So there needs to be some kind of objective that, that tells you how good a job you're doing uh, in fitting your model to the data. For example, in, in measuring the, the errors you're making in predicting stuff about the training data um, based on the current set of parameters that you're plugging into the model. And also the objective might capture some information about the, the prior knowledge. It might uh, penalize you for deviating too far from what you already know about the model. So other typical problems that come, th that you have to deal with in learning problems as opposed to other sorts of optimization problems, for instance, 
Now, that typically, you, you, or often, you're dealing with a very large underlying data set. And another sort of unusual property in learning problems that you don't have in other optimization problems is that you, you don't necessarily need the solution to very high accuracy, okay? You might be perfectly happy with a low to medium accuracy solution. Now, when I talk about that, I'm talking about the objective that you're posing in the first part of the problem, okay? So, you know, this is a property that learning problems do share with other areas of optimization. Sometimes the objective that you're working on, that you're trying to minimize, doesn't necessarily correspond to the objective that you really want to minimize, which might be some sort of, you know, count of classification error on the training set. It might be some sort of proxy for that. And so it, it may not be worth your while putting a tremendous, tremendous amount of effort into exactly optimizing this objective when the thing you really want to work with is something a little bit different from that. I could also have mentioned here of particular relevance to deep learning is that non-convexity is another property that, that comes in, particularly in this area as opposed to uh, maybe other areas of, um, of learning. So finally I made this comment that formulation is an optimization problem. In some cases it's well established how you write down uh, the formulation as an optimization problem. For example, the support vector machines paradigm has been around for decades now and it's well understood how to write that down as a, a, as a linear or quadratic program. Um, logistic regression is another idea that comes up in when you're trying to maximize a, a likelihood function. Recommender systems is a more recent idea where you're trying to fill in a matrix or learn a low rank matrix based on information about individual elements of that matrix. So it's more recent but again, you know, there are pretty well uh, understood paradigms for how you write that down as an optimization problem. Other areas it's not so well settled and uh, people are still sort of toying with different optimization formulations. Okay, so um, a few more notes here about the properties of optimization problems that come out of learning applications. Uh, one thing is this idea of imposing structure that I've already mentioned. Um, and this is, there's some crossover here with this whole area of compressed sensing, which has uh, been another area that's burst into prominence in the last seven or eight years. Um, maybe the simplest uh, kind of structure that you might want to impose, and one that's still very useful despite being very simple, is that if I denote the, very, the vector of unknowns in the optimization problem by x, um, very often I'm interested in approximate solutions that are sparse, that is where x only has a few non-zeros in it. Uh, and that even came up in Bengio's talk this morning and in some of the talks last week. So it's been well known for a long time that one way to induce sparsity in the vector x is to add a term, the L1 norm of x, somewhere in the objective or maybe in the constraints. So the L1 norm of a vector is simply the sum of the absolute values of the components of the vector. And it's been known for a long time that, you know, adding some multiple of L1 in the objective, for example, and minimizing that, um, tends to give you a solution where a lot of the elements of x are zero, which is what you're looking for. Um, one of the contributions of compressed sensing in the work that was done in the middle of the last decade was to explain exactly why the L1 norm works so well. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's convex, it's a convex function, and yet it can induce this sort of very non-convex sort of structure into x. But there are some reasons why it works. Another idea that's come up more recently is that if you're looking, if the variable in optimization problem is a matrix X and you're interested in matrices with low rank, there was this idea of the nuclear norm that was posited in maybe order of about five years ago, which is simply the sum of the singular values of X. And that plays a similar role to L1. If you add some multiple of the nuclear norm to the objective and minimize that, it tends to give you a low rank, um, a low rank solution X. In other words, it, tends to set most of the singular values to zero. Okay, objectives, uh, you know, we've already talked a little bit about that. You can construct objectives from Bayesian statistical principles, maximum likelihood ideas, and so on. Um, I'll just make a note here that these objectives that crop up in learning applications typically have a lot of structure. Uh, very often you get this sort of partially separable structure where the function you're trying to minimize is a sum with possibly many, many terms in it. Uh, where each, each term in the sum might be related to a single item of data. So if you've got a training set with many sort of um, feature vectors and associated labels, um, there could be one term in the sum that captures uh, 
the, uh, the sort of a loss for each term, for each element of the data set. In other words, it could be a term that penalizes you if you made an incorrect prediction about that piece of data, for example. So the number of terms in the sum could correspond to the size of the data set, for instance. Another feature too is that uh, if you've got this kind of a structure in the objective, that each term in the sum might depend on just a small number of elements of x. It might not look at the entire set of unknowns. It might only touch on a few of them. And that can be important too in designing algorithms. Another feature that's of interest sometimes is that um, particularly if the number of elements in x is very large, the gradient of f is, of course has the same length as the vector x and it might be possible sometimes to get subvectors of x at much cheaper cost than the full gradient or estimates of subvectors at a much lower cost than the full gradient. And that's a particularly interesting situation when you want to use decomposition algorithms where you just want to minimize over subvectors at any one time. And sometimes you see these two things happening together. Okay. So here are some examples that probably most of you are very familiar with. Support vector machines I mentioned earlier, a very well established paradigm and here's a typical setup when you've got a linear SVM. So the feature vectors are vectors xi that have length say n, um, yi is the label say plus or minus one on the vector x, uh, on the vector xi. And the thing you're trying to learn here are the weights that you apply to the elements of x that give you a good prediction about which class a new vector, a new piece of data x will fall into. Plus one class or the minus one class. And so you've got a, a, an objective function here that consists of a sum over all the training vectors. So it has this partially separable structure that I talked about earlier. And then there's a loss function. It basically penalizes you if w is, is putting xi in the wrong class, on the wrong side of the objective, or not far enough on the, on the right side for instance. Um, and then there's another parameter here and there's a sort of a regularization term that I won't explain what that does. Um, here's another problem with partially separable structure, matrix completion that crops up in recommender systems. So here we're looking for a, a k by n, uh, no we're given a k by n matrix m but we're only told some of the entries in m and what we're trying to learn are matrices L and R such that m is approximately equal to L times R transpose. So the unknowns in this problem are L and R, okay? And again, we're summing over all the elements of X that we know. So this set E consists of all the entries in, X, in M that we know. And we're trying to make, uh, on each of those entries, we're trying to make the product of LR, restricted to that single entry, match M as closely as possible. And then we've got some regularization terms here which essentially uh, try to impose um, some uh, structure on L, on, on L and R, try to capture that low rank type structure. So there are two examples of that, um, uh, of, of objectives that have the kind of structure that I mentioned earlier. Here's a couple more examples that again crop up in learning applications. Uh, this is sort of, an, you can think of this as a variant on, on support vector machines, the case of regularized logistic regression, where again you're interested in looking for a set of weights that you apply to the features that sort of tell you the odds of whether, it tells you a little bit more than, uh, uh, than just making a prediction about which of the two classes it falls into. Potentially with like regularized logistic regression you can actually get the odds of, uh, of x falling into one or other of the classes. So the loss function represents a log rather than a uh, say a hinge loss or something. And you can extend that to multi-class problems. I won't try to explain this, but in th this sort of deals with a case where you've got a feature, feature vectors xi that can fall into one of uh, m different classes. And again, you can kind of extend this idea of an objective to, um, so that uh, in the end, once you've learnt a set of weights wj, one set of weights for each class, you can use that to tell you the chances that a new vector x, a new feature vector x, lies in each of the m classes. Okay. Uh, and here's some examples of this partial gradient structure. So support vector machines, if you extend that to use, uh, to consider the idea of kernels, where you sort of take the features and implicitly project them into a higher dimensional space before you do the classification, uh, the, you know, people have been giving lectures on how you do that for many years now, but you end up often uh, in dual space you end up with a quadratic program. 
And this is a problem where you can actually calculate a piece of the gradient much more cheaply than calculating the full gradient, simply because this kernel function is sometimes expensive to evaluate. So there are many methods in, uh, for solving uh, SVM where you just calculate, say, two elements of the gradient, or maybe ten elements of the gradient. And you can do that just by evaluating two rows of the kernel matrix, which is a lot cheaper than evaluating the whole thing, for example. And similar things happen in logistic regression. Okay. So I'm just sort of pointing forward to, to maybe the third lecture that I'll give tomorrow, where, which sort of exploits this property that pieces of a gradient vector are sometimes cheaper than, than the whole vector. And finally, in, this, in the vein of this introductory stuff, I'll just sort of mention that um, uh, there, there are sort of two approaches. When you're presented with one of these partially separable functions, um, one thing you can do is to sample from the whole da data set, big E here, just take a, a fairly large but fixed sample and then treat that as your objective. You know, throw all the machinery from optimization at minimizing that F. So that means every time you need a gradient, you have to scan over the complete sample that you've taken. Every time you need a Hessian, you may need to scan over the, the whole sample or maybe just some subsample, okay? So that's one approach and that's sort of a batch idea. Another approach the, at the other extreme is the incremental approach where you just pick a single element from the sum and use that to get yourself an estimate of the gradient or maybe an estimate of the Hessian, okay? And take some step, update your guess of x just based on that very sketchy, incomplete set of information. And that's sometimes known as stochastic, stochastic approximation, okay? And then there's sort of a compromise between these two things where um, you take what's called a mini batch, and I think many of you have probably heard of this idea of a mini batch, where you don't just, you sort of do something incremental, but you don't just take a single term, you take maybe 10 or 100 or 1,000 terms, okay? So it's, it's fairly, you take a small batch relative to the complete data set, but still it hopefully gives you more reliable estimates of the gradient than just taking a single element, okay? And I'll just mention finally some that, you know, connections between optimization and machine learning go back an awfully long way. Um, back propagation, which came up in uh, Bengio's talk and I'm sure has come up last week as well in neural networks, is a kind of incremental gradient method, okay? Those ideas are uh, very much related to ideas you see happening in automatic differentiation where you sort of back out the objective um, by sort of working backwards from the top level through the neural network. And you can use that to sort of update the weights at each node. Uh, support vector machines, as I mentioned, is an idea that's been around, I'd say here since the late 80s, maybe it goes back further than that. But certainly uh, by the late 1990s, there was a lot of interaction between optimization people and machine learning people where they were using different ideas from optimization to solve these SVM uh, problems and lots of different algorithms and were sort of sparking a lot of new research and optimization along those lines. And then the whole area of research in stochastic gradient goes back many years. I mean, the basic algorithm even goes back to 1951. Um, and this was an interesting case because it, there was work going on in this area in the optimization community 1980 onwards in Russia and sort of a parallel stream of work going on in the machine learning community on, and getting much the same results, theoretically speaking. But of course, the machine learning people had lots of really interesting applications that the optimizers didn't know that much about. And fairly recently, these two communities got together and now there's a lot of work going on and uh, sort of at the interface of, of this area in both communities. Yes, Jan. Right. Right. Sure, sorry about that. I, 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 in fact, meant to correct that on my slide, but I'd already given them to the organizers before I got a chance. But thanks for pointing that out. By the way, these slides are on the web, uh, on the same website with the schedule and so on. So if you haven't downloaded them already, you can do that. It might be a little easier to see. Okay. So now let me talk about gradient methods, and this will certainly take us through to lunchtime. So these, in a sense, are maybe the most fundamental kinds of, uh, some fundamental class of, of methods for smooth, unconstrained optimization. Uh, but uh, fundamental in the sense that they can be extended into many other 
uh, more sophisticated sorts of methods and to many other problems that, uh, involving constraints and non-smoothness as well as the uh, class that I'm going to originally talk about. So I'm going to be addressing the class of simply minimizing a smooth function f and I'm going to make some assumptions about uh, convexity, namely that um, the eigenvalues of the Hessian are bounded between two non-negative values. So mu is a lower bound in the eigenvalue of the Hessian, sort of gives you some lower bound on the convexity of the function, although we will allow mu to be zero in a lot of this analysis, and L is an upper bound, okay? So uh, you've got this convexity expression, and mu in a sense tells you at least how much curvature you have in F, and that can be very useful in designing algorithms. And we also consider the ratio of these two things, L over mu, the ratio of the largest to the smallest eigenvalue, that defines the conditioning of the problem. And problems with larger condition number are typically harder to solve, okay? If you've got a problem where the uh, Hessian is close to being the identity or a multiple of the identity, that's typically very efficiently solvable with uh, gradient type method. And sometimes I restrict my attention in particular to convex, the quadratic case where f is actually a quadratic function. So it has the form x transpose ax where the eigenvalues of a lie between uh, mu and l. All right, so what is the idea? Well, I'm going to assume that I can evaluate f and grad f whenever I need to. But the methods that I'll talk about are motivated by the fact that we want to extend this eventually to wider classes of problems. So we want to be able to consider non-smooth f, certainly interesting in machine learning, particularly when you've got regularization going on. Um, also interested in the case where it's too hard to evaluate the function. In other words, we might be able to evaluate an estimate of the gradient but evaluating the function is way too much work than we're prepared to do, okay? So can we talk about gradient type methods that are extendable to that sort of setting? Again, uh, this has already come up. If I only have an estimate of the gradient or maybe a subgradient, uh, I'd like what I say in this section to be extendable to that situation. I'd also like to extend it to the case where you've got constraints. Maybe I want to minimize f over some set omega where omega might be simple in a sense might be a ball or a box or a simplex or something. And secondly, I might want to uh, extend these methods eventually to the case where F has uh, a regularization term that's non-smooth attached to it. For example, some multiple of the L1 norm, okay? So most of what I say is going to be extendable or uh, potentially extendable to these cases. Okay, so the simplest kind of gradient method, I think, is the one where you simply, uh, xk here denotes an iteration after k steps, you're at some point xk, which is your latest greatest estimate of the solution. So you've got a formula from going to, from xk to xk plus one. And the way you make that step is you simply take a move in the negative gradient direction. Now, that has a physical motivation. If you look at a, were to look at a contour map of the function f, you'd see a bunch of, you know, lines indicating that join the points where f has equal values. If you were to plot f, xk on that map and look at the steepest descent direction, the direction in which the contours are decreasing most steeply, that's the direction you're moving in, okay? And the only decision you're making is how far do you move in that direction. Now, clearly, the way in which you choose alpha, uh, you'd like to be able to choose alpha so that it gives you some sort of decent decrease in f, okay? And because you're moving in the negative gradient direction, it's easy to show using a Taylor series argument that if you take very small alphas, you, you are guaranteed to decrease f, okay? But you'd like more than that. You'd like to actually get, a re get as much decrease as you can in a sense, or get a reasonably significant amount of decrease out of, out of stepping in this direction. If you take a really short step, then you're sort of condemning yourself to taking many, many steps before you get anywhere near a solution. So you'd like to take a substantial step, but still you don't want it to be too long that you sort of overshoot a minimum and, and end up making uh, f even worse. Although we'll talk about some methods later that do just that. But uh, so there are sort of some options in deciding how to choose alpha. One way is you can actually make a serious attempt to minimize f along this direction. So you can actually try to choose the optimal alpha or something close to it in some sense. Uh, that's, you know, that's hard because you need to be able to evaluate f at each, each time you try a new alpha, you need to figure out what f is and see how you're doing and use that information and maybe choose a better value. 
you might even need to evaluate the gradient at the, at the new point uh, and use that to sort of improve your estimate. So a second way that's a, a little bit easier is to do backtracking where you make some initial guess for alpha, let's call it alpha bar, and you try stepping in that, you try taking a step of that length and you evaluate f at that point and if, if it's making things worse, if the new f is worse than the older f, you might simply just try taking one half alpha as your next guess and plugging that in and seeing if, how f does at that point. Um, if that doesn't work, try one quarter alpha and so on. You just keep backtracking until you get something that gives you a decrease in f. Okay? That's, a, that's a relatively easy approach, but it still needs to know values of f. All right? And the third op option is to do something really trivial, which is you don't even bother uh, calculating f or grad f at the new point. You just blindly take a step using the information that you maybe know about f. So sometimes you do have access to this information of what the upper and lower eigenvalue bounds are. And you can use, you can combine that information in a way that's guaranteed to give you an improvement of f. And so one op option is to simply do that, okay? So um, the advantage of the third strategy, the, the trivial idea, is that you can prove things about rate of convergence. Um, besides not having to know f, you can prove things about convergence rates. You often can't prove too much about rate of convergence for these two. That's not to say that, that, this is gonna, that number three is going to work better in practice. It typically doesn't. But, you know, at least you've got some, something provable. And also it gives you something you can build on, as, you, as we'll see in a moment. Okay, let me say a little bit more about line search strategies. This is in particular uh, the first option where you try to make some serious attempt to find a good value of alpha. So, in chapter three of my book with Jorge Nosedal, who's going to be uh, talking later this week, has a lot of theory for this case, and this is partly interesting because it, it also works for the non-convex case, whereas the third option that I'm going to talk about more is specifically tuned to the convex case. But the theory for this just says it gives you some conditions on the alpha, on what properties you want the alpha to have. Now, these conditions are all satisfied if the alpha really is a minimizer along the negative gradient direction, okay? But this is a relaxation of that because it's, it's usually way too much work and unnecessary work to find the exact minimizer. Instead, you look for a point that makes a substantial improvement in f, and this is what I mean by substantial improvement, the new value of f is less than or equal to the old value minus some multiple times alpha times the gradient, the square norm of the gradient. And that's achievable. There are certainly going to be points that, that meet that criterion. And the second criterion is the one that says that um, you have to be sort of somewhere in the vicinity of a minimizer, okay? Very loosely defined. So the first criterion sort of tells you, yes, you are making a substantial decrease in F. The problem with just imposing the first criterion is that it's satisfied even if alpha is very, very tiny. So it may not move very far. The second criterion sort of guarantees that you at least will take some substantial step, okay, away from the current xk. And you can prove all kinds of things about methods that satisfy these two conditions. You can prove, for example, that accumulation points, even in the non-convex case, are stationary points. That is, they're points where the gradient is zero. If you're dealing with a convex function f, this is telling you that you're at a minimizer, okay? Now, there's a whole, in, or there was a whole industry back in the 70s and 80s of figuring out efficient methods that do this one-dimensional optimization along the negative gradient direction to calculate an ap appropriate value for alpha. And there's some of them in, in this uh, chapter that I just referred you to, very sophisticated methods that, that uh, uh, accumulate information, are guaranteed to g give you convergence to one of these alphas, and that often also are very efficient. They often only need to make, say, three guesses before they find a suitable value. But I'm going to skip all that because a lot of that, I think, is not uh, particularly relevant to the kinds of problems that you guys want to solve. Okay? The second category that I mentioned were these backtracking strategies where you make some initial guess and then you just keep multiplying it by some fixed constant, less than one, until it gives you a sufficient decrease in f. And the sufficient decrease criterion can be exactly the one that I mentioned on this slide. In other words, you can just try each value of alpha, they're getting smaller and smaller, and you can check this condition, 
and see if it works. Okay? If it doesn't, you just backtrack again. In other words, you don't have to check this condition. Okay? You're not checking this condition that's guaranteeing you that alpha is not too small. But you don't need to, because if you're doing backtracking, you know that alpha is not going to be too small. You know that alpha is within striking distance of, of an alpha that is, is bad. Okay? Because the previous value of alpha that you tried before you backtracked was no good. Okay? So you know that the current value is at least you know, within a multiple of two of a value that's overshooting. All right? So in other words, it's not too short. All right? It's not too short in the sense that um, if you go too much further, it's going to be bad. So you don't have to check the second condition. And you can prove many of the same properties about uh, accumulation points being stationary and so on. But let me say more about the third case, because this is the one that we can really build on in this area. And this is the one where you just uh, fix a value of alpha based on the, the knowledge that you may have about the upper and lower bounds on the eigenvalues of the Hessian. Now first of all, you can go and use Taylor series, which is a tool that is ubiquitous whenever you're dealing with smooth optimization. Taylor series, which you would have learned, I think, in maybe second semester calculus, it's a way of forming simple linear or quadratic approximations to a general smooth function based on the information at a particular point. Okay? And that's exactly what we do when we do optimization, is that we sort of gather information at the current point xk, maybe also use information that we learnt at previous points, and we use that to construct a simple model of the function that we're trying to, or the problem that we're trying to solve, and then take a step on the basis of that model. So in the case of unconstrained optimization, it's very simple because we can form a quadratic model of f to give us a basic idea of what's going on in the vicinity of the current point xk. And we can use that, we can plug in the step that we're actually taking. The difference between xk and xk plus 1 is exactly alpha k times grad f. If we plug that into the second order Taylor series model, we get this bound, the, this upper bound on f of xk plus 1, the new value of f. And we can find that it's upper bounded by f minus this quantity, which depends on alpha and depends on the upper bound on the eigenvalues, times the two norm of the gradient squared. Now this is interesting because it's telling us that we're guaranteed to get a decrease provided alpha is very small, right? If alpha is very small, this term's going to be positive, this term's going to be slightly less than one and positive, and this is guaranteed to be positive unless we're already out of solution. Okay? So we're guaranteed to get a, 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 um, a decrease for small alpha. In fact, what we can do is to choose alpha to minimize this product of these first two terms. That would sort of be a greedy strategy, right? And the optimal value of alpha that does that is simply 1 over L, 1 over the, the upper bound in the eigenvalues. And if you plug alpha equals 1 over L into this expression, you get this amount of decrease in the function, okay? So you're guaranteed to get better with this step length at every point. In fact, you can even say a little bit more about how fast you're going to converge to a solution. For a start, what we can do is just simply rearrange this expression, put the norm of the gradient on the left-hand side, put the difference of the function values on the right-hand side, and then we can say sum over k equals 1 up to n, or up, you know, k equals, actually I should have said k equals 0 up to n here, and we get this classic telescoping sum on the right-hand side where you've got each two elements in the, in the sum are partly cancelling each other out. And you simply end up on the right-hand side with the difference between the initial function value and the, the current function value that you are at now. The sum of all the gradient norms squared is going to be bounded by that difference. So if you know a priori, which you often do, that the function value is bounded below, you know for sure that the, the gradients of f must be going to zero, right? They can't be bounded away from zero, or at least most of them must be going to zero. Um, they can't be bounded away from zero because in that case you would have um, the sum of the left-hand side would be infinite, all right? So right away that's sort of indicating to you that this strategy is leading you to, uh, uh, to convergence. In fact, you can say a little bit more. So we can build on that a little bit here. Um, what I'll do now is to take, to actually, uh, I assume I'm dealing with a convex function here, so the minimizer of the convex function is x star, that's the thing that we're trying to find. 
So again, by using the fact that the difference between xk and xk plus 1 is negative alpha k times gradient of f, I can make that substitution here, xk plus 1 equals xk minus alpha times grad f, multiply out this, this two norm squared, and again use the Taylor series approximation to figure out that the new distance to the solution, squared, after I've taken the step, is less than or equal to the current distance minus this quantity that's a lot like what I had earlier, okay, when I was dealing with the change in f rather than the change in the distance to x star. So again, I can use this to infer that for alpha sufficiently small, I am actually getting closer to the solution at every point. Okay, now I'm going to bring in this, this quantity delta k, which is the difference between the current function value and the optimal function value. I'm going to want that to go to zero. Okay, so, uh, and I can use the fact that, again, using Taylor series approximation and using this, inequal uh, this inequality to do with the, the, the inner product being bounded by the product of the norms of the two vectors involved, I can use that information, I can plug that into the formula on the previous page, okay, subtract f of x star from both sides of this formula, and I can end up with this expression that tells me how the, the delta in f, how the error in f, function value, is decreasing at every step. And what I find is that the new error in f is less than or equal to the current error minus this quantity that, that depends on the square of the current error. Okay, what I'm aiming at here is some sort of rate result about how fast the error in f is converging to the solution. And in fact, that's revealed on the next slide because I can take this inequality, this term here and the right and the far right hand side, I can take the reciprocal of both sides, do a little bit of elementary manipulation and end up finding that delta k plus one, which is this quantity here, is less than or equal to this object here, x naught, this should be x star here, x naught minus x star squared, the original error in x, divided by k plus one. So what, that, what is that telling me? It's telling me that the error in the function value is going down at sort of a one over k rate, okay? So the short step, steepest descent approach is giving me a sub, sublinear convergence at a one over k rate. So all I need to know is L, the upper bound on the, on the eigenvalues of the Hessian. If I know L, if I set alpha k accordingly to this constant value, I get uh, convergence of F to the solution at this one over k rate, okay? So that's something. We can say more than just saying we're converging, okay? We can say we're converging at a certain rate. Now, I haven't used at all the fact that we may have also have a lower bound on the eigenvalues. If you've got a lower bound on the eigenvalues of L, you can make an even better choice of alpha. You can set alpha to be 2 over mu plus L. And you can show using similar kinds of arguments based on Taylor's theorem, elementary you know, inequalities for inner products and so on. <coughs> you can show that the, the error in xk squared is less than or equal to this number here, which is some number slightly less than 1, raised to the power 2k times the initial error in x squared. Okay, And here I've got this kappa, which I told you earlier was the ratio of, of L to mu, the conditioning of the problem. So if kappa is very large, if you've got an ill-conditioned problem, this number in the parentheses is very close to 1. Okay, So that this uh, quantity is going down slowly. If you've got a well-conditioned problem, if kappa is close to 1, this number in here is closer to 0. Okay, And so you get more rapid convergence from the short step strategy. Okay. But again, if you've got this additional knowledge of a lower bound in the eigenvalues, you can make a smarter choice of the constant step length and you can get linear convergence. Now linear convergence will always trump sublinear convergence, okay? 1 over k goes down much more slowly than some number gamma to the k, okay? Provided k is anything substantial, all right? So if you can get linear convergence, you're usually doing a lot better than if you can get sublinear convergence. But in the case where you might, suppose you're only dealing with a weakly convex function where mu is zero, um, this might be the best that you can do in that case. Okay? Can't often do too much better than that. Okay, uh, and this was some argument about uh, uh, how, you, how we got to that result, which I'll skip over. <coughs> 
So, oh, by the way, I just want to mention, this is a little bit of a hobby horse of mine, sometimes, particularly in the machine learning literature, people call this exponential convergence, okay? It, it, we, we typically call this in the optimization literature, we usually call this linear convergence. But exponential sounds much sexier and much faster, right? Uh -huh. But it's really the same thing. And I prefer to call it linear or maybe geometric convergence, okay? I think that's a bit more descriptive as to what's going on. All right. So you might ask a question, I've showed you that for weakly convex functions where you, where you don't know what mu is, or mu may be zero, the lower bound on the eigenvalues, we've shown that a very naive um, short step, steepest descent strategy will give us uh, a sublinear convergence rate at, at the rate of one over k. So the question might be, if you, if you, take, if you consider this kind of algorithm, can you potentially do better on a weakly convex function? Can you maybe get, you know, linear convergence even though you've only got weak convexity? The answer to that is no, and there's this very nice result in Nesterov's book from 2004 where he shows that you can never do, for this kind of algorithm, for a general smooth f, you're never going to get faster than 1 over k squared. Now 1 over k squared is faster than 1 over k, clearly, okay? It's going down faster than 1 over k. But he's got a function here that shows that uh, at least on the early iterations for solving this problem, you're not going to go down faster than 1 over k squared. And here's the idea. You've got this function where it's, it's quadratic, it has this form. The uh, Hessian is tridiagonal, A is tridiagonal, and the linear term is, um, is all zeros except for a 1 in the first element. Now if you consider running an algorithm of this type for any alpha, it doesn't matter what alpha is here, this is totally general, the only restriction is that it has exactly the steepest descent structure that I showed you earlier. Then um, what you can show is that if you start from zero, if your initial guess is zero, each time you take one of these steps and evaluate the new gradient, the gradient is simply a times x minus e1, that the gradient, the, the non-zeros in the gradient, uh, sorry, the gradient of f starts out having a single non-zero. At the initial point, x naught equals zero, the gradient is simply negative E1. It has a single non-zero at the top. As the iterations progress, the gradients in gra the non-zeros in grad F gradually spread from top to bottom. At each iteration, you're picking up one more location that has a non-zero, okay? So eventually, after N iterations or so, I've got N over two here, but I think it's N, um, you, you fill up the gradient and potentially you might be making some real progress at that point. But the point is that if the solution is this point here, xi is completely dense and um, the elements decay only slowly as you go from top to bottom in the solution x star i, that it, certainly in those first n iterations you're not even trying to approximate the later elements of the solution toward the end of the vector. And they're making up a substantial part of the error between your current xk and the solution x star. So in other words, until you get through n iterations, you've got no hope of really uh, approximating the solution all that well. And you can show, in fact, that the difference in the function values between xk and x star is, um, is bounded by this quantity, is bounded below by this quantity, this 1 over k squared type quantity, okay? So you know, that this, you know from the theory that I showed you earlier that this can be bounded above by 1 over k, but now we know that it's also bounded below by 1 over k squared. Okay. So <clears throat> I've showed you this you know, very um, naive way to choose alpha, and we've been able to prove something about rates of convergence for that alpha in different circumstances, weakly convex, strongly convex. So you might ask the question, can you do better if you're greedier with the alpha, if you actually make a serious attempt to find the minimizing alpha along the current direction, or at least um, maybe, maybe even go to the exact value? Does that help to speed up the convergence? And the answer is no, maybe somewhat surprisingly. And you can actually cook up a very simple counterexample to show why uh, it doesn't work, or at least to, uh, to see that it doesn't work. And the simple example is again a quadratic function f, where f of x is just one half times x transpose ax for some matrix A. So the Hessian of f is simply the matrix A, it's constant. Um, its eigenvalues are, again, between mu and L, as we've assumed. 
Now, given that f has such a simple form, we can actually write down a closed form expression for alpha k. We can just uh, plug the gradient into f and we can figure out exactly where the minimizer is analytically. Okay? And we can figure out what properties then does do the successive elements in the sequence have, how fast do their function values go down. So you can show using some elementary linear algebra uh, inequalities that um, f of x k plus 1 is less than or equal to f of x k minus this ratio that involves the x k's in the matrix A. Um, I'm not going to try to explain all the inequalities, but you can eventually show, okay, I've gone into a lot of detail here. I'll put it on the slides in case you want to work through this as an exercise. You can eventually show that uh, the, the error in f goes down at this rate times the previous error in f. This is exactly the rate that I showed you earlier for uh, the norm of xk minus x star squared which is actually very closely related to the difference in the function values. So in other words, by taking, by using the exact minimizing alpha at every step, we really do no better than if we just take that step of 2 over L plus mu, okay? At least the upper bound is no better. The actual performance might be a little bit better, but the upper bound is, is no better at all than what we got with the, with the naive choice, which is a little bit surprising. But you might ask, okay, uh, is this just purely an upper bound that's very pessimistic? If we do an exact minimizing alpha in practice, can we usually expect to do better? The answer there is still no, okay? Which is a little bit surprising until you look at an example. And this is something you can program up in a few lines of MATLAB. You can define a quadratic function f with two variables, okay? And I've drawn the contours of such, such a function here. And you can define the A, the constant Hessian of that function, to be any symmetric positive definite matrix where you say control the ratio of the two singular values. It's got two eigenvalues. And you can, you, you can try turning a knob to, to turn that from a well-conditioned problem where the two eigenvalues are maybe the same to one where it's ill-conditioned, where the ratio between the two eigenvalues is very large. So here's a problem where the ratio between the two eigenvalues is maybe two or three. Okay, so it's a little bit ill-conditioned, but really not, not too bad. Okay, if you were to run a um, steepest descent with exact minimizing alpha on this problem, you'll find that it, it doesn't go to the solution all that rapidly. Once kappa gets to, the condition number gets to 10, or certainly when it gets to 100, you get this kind of zigzagging behavior, where you tend to, what you'd like to do here is to maybe go to the bottom of the valley Okay, and then when you evaluate the gradient at the bottom of the valley, it's going to be pointing right at the solution. Okay, so you hope that you go to the bottom of the valley and then the next step will get you there. That's not what happens. What happens is that you, if you find the exactly minimizing alpha, it actually overshoots the bottom of the valley a little bit. And so on the next step, when you have to move in the negative gradient direction, you end up coming back almost in the opposite direction to where you just moved. And this happens over and over again. You get this zigzagging kind of behavior. And you can actually see this when you code it up. Okay? So you do get convergence at a linear rate, but it's, a, it's at a, a slow linear rate. And it gets slower and slower as the condition number increases. Okay, I'm going to come back to that example later. Okay? Because it, there is some benefit to maybe doing something different with the alphas. So we'll come back to that later. But before we do, I know I have to stop at 12 because we're up against a, a hard break for lunch, um, but we can always pick this up after lunch. Um, let me talk about an extension uh, to, to the negative, to the steepest descent idea, which doesn't use any more information that we've been using so far, namely it always needs a gradient every step, and it needs some information about upper and lower bounds on the eigenvalues, that's all it needs but it does much better in terms of convergence rate. And it, it turns out that this idea is, is known as heavy ball. It's been around for many years. But the same idea that's used in heavy ball crops up in other methods, such as conjugate gradient, that have, been, that have developed you know, by completely independent means. And it turns out there's a unifying theme to all these methods. And the theme is that instead of just stepping from xk to xk plus 1 purely in the negative gradient direction, you also use some information about the step that you just took. 
In other words, there's this idea of momentum. In going from xk to xk plus 1, you sort of keep moving in the same direction that you were moving in on the previous step, but you tweak it a little bit in the direction of the negative gradient that you've just evaluated. Okay? So there's an idea of sort of using the latest gradient direction, but also using this momentum that you've built up from the previous iteration. Now notice that you're not just using the previous step, implicitly you're using the entire history of the iterates here, because the previous step incorporated information from the step before, and that one incorporated information from the step before. So in some sense, you know, there's some element of the whole history of the iteration sequence encoded in this part of the step. Okay? So, the question at hand though is that by doing this, is there any advantage to doing this? Okay, rather than just setting beta equals zero and doing what we were doing before. How can we analyze this? Well, there's a very simple analysis. There's a book by Polyak from, it's now 27 years old, at least the, the English translation, that has this very simple, beautiful analysis of this approach. So what he does is to try to use the knowledge of the upper and lower bounds and the eigenvalues to make choices of alpha and beta that are optimal. Just like we did in choosing alpha optimally when we were doing the previous analysis. So the key to his analysis is to do something that people who do high dimensional ODEs, it's to use a similar trick to what they do. Um, and that is that instead of just looking at what happens on, uh, to the error on a single step, you construct this sort of composite vector which, which encodes the error from the last two steps. Okay? So this is a vector of length 2n, which has the current error on it and the previous error. And you look at how WK changes from one iteration to the next. You try to come up with a relationship between WK and WK plus 1. Now again, you can use Taylor series to come up with, with this more or less linear relationship between WK and WK plus 1. You can show that, um, that WK is approximately a matrix B, uh, WK plus 1 is approximately matrix B times WK plus some lower order term. Okay? What is this matrix B? Well, let's look at the second row of this matrix. So the second component of WK plus 1 is going to be XK minus X star. All right? If I increment K, WK plus 1, the second part of it is going to be XK minus X star. That's equal to the first component of WK. Right? So if I multiply out the second row of this, inequal uh, of this equality here, Indeed, I get this. I get that the second component of WK plus 1 equals the first component of WK. So you can certainly see where the bottom part of BK comes from. Okay? The top part of BK comes from this relationship here. If I subtract X star from both sides of this expression, uh, I can see that, you know, you can see alpha and beta creeping in here. The only other tool you need to use is Taylor's uh, theorem again. Taylor's theorem says that the gradient of F of XK is approximately equal to the Hessian of f at x star times xk minus x star. That's one way to uh, write Taylor's theorem. Sorry, I don't have a blackboard. I'd write it down for you. But that's where that comes from. Okay? That comes from doing a Taylor series uh, approximation to this quantity here. So in other words, you can show that there's almost a stationary linear relationship between wk from one iteration to the next, accepting this term, which is kind of the residual in Taylor's theorem. Okay? So that means that we'll, we can expect to get a contraction in WK. We, we hope that the WKs are going to zero. Okay? We can do that by designing the matrix B so that its maximum singular value is as far away from 1 as possible. Okay? What, how can we design the matrix B? We've got freedom over how to choose the alpha and the beta. So we can pick alpha and beta to make the maximum eigenvalue of B as small as possible. And to do that, we just have to do a little bit, little bit of linear algebra. We can first of all diagonalize the Hessian. Okay? We can sort of do a similarity transformation on B to replace the Hessian with a diagonal matrix containing its eigenvalues. Okay? We have information about these eigenvalues. Okay? Lambda i. We know that they're all between mu and L. All right? We've got information about the, the interval that they fall in. So using that information, we can by using a, just a linear al algebra argument, we can explicitly pick alpha and beta to minimize the maximum eigenvalue of this matrix, and this is what you end up with. It takes a few lines of linear algebra, 
But you end up with alpha is this formula that depends on L, and it also depends on mu, because kappa is just L over mu. So if you know L over mu, you can plug them into this formula, you can get alpha. You can also get beta, okay? And this is the punchline. Uh, uh, when you plug those into the formula, you'll find that the maximum eigenvalue of the matrix of, of the matrix B is 1 minus 2 over the square root of kappa plus 1. All right? Now that looks a lot like the convergence rate that we got for steepest descent. But there's a very big difference. The big difference is that what used to be kappa is now the square root of kappa. Okay? So in other words, um, you've improved the, the linear constant that tells you how much better you're doing at each iteration. You've moved it further away from 1. Okay? significantly further away from one. How does that translate into how many iterations you need to take to achieve a certain accuracy? Well, it has a dramatic effect, okay? In other words, if you want the accuracy to be less than, say, some threshold epsilon, the number of iterations you need to take, k, has to be big enough to reduce your linear convergence rate raised to the power k. It has to be big enough to make that less than epsilon. By taking logs of both sides, that gives you an estimate of how big k needs to be. Now, for steepest descent, k has to be greater than some multiple of kappa, the condition number, times, times log epsilon. For heavy ball, k only has to be bigger than or equal to square root of kappa times log epsilon. So if you're dealing with a condition number of 100, which is not particularly ill-conditioned, you, you, uh, you've reduced the amount of work you need to do by a factor of 10, okay? Which is a significant reduction. So this almost is for free, right? You've, you haven't used any more information that you needed for steepest descent. Um, you've used a little bit more storage maybe because you have to sort of store the previous iteration, which may or may not be very onerous, usually not. But for free, you've got this, um, uh, you've got this significant improvement in the, in the convergence. Okay, um, I think I'll take another two and a half minutes to take us up to the break. Um, because I want to highlight how, how similar conjugate gradient is to, to what I just said in heavy ball. So conjugate gradient has very much the same idea of momentum going on. Okay, conjugate gradient is another class of methods that actually arose from uh, solving systems of linear equations, but it turns out to be applicable to minimizing smooth functions as well. Um, and uh, I won't go into the derivation or the history of conjugate gradient, I'll just point out what the steps in the conjugate gradient method are. So what conjugate gradient does is it maintains a, a search direction PK and it takes steps in the direction of PK. So PK replaces a negative gradient in the uh, steepest descent method. But how does it calculate PK? It calculates that PK to be the negative gradient plus some multiple of the PK from the previous iteration. So there's very much the idea of momentum still going on here, okay? You take the previous search direction and you tweak it a little bit um, uh, in the direction of the current gradient. In fact, you can make an exact identification with heavy ball by setting the, co the constants in conjugate gradient differently. Now, conjugate gradient is a little bit different and maybe better in that it doesn't need you to estimate L and mu. It sort of figures it out for itself, uh, the appropriate way to combine the current gradient and the previous search direction. And there's a whole uh, literature on how um, you choose this constant in the conjugate gradient case, and particularly in the nonlinear case. There are formulas such as the ratio of the last two gradient values and so on. Um, but the thing that I really wanted to highlight here is that it has um, very similar kind of spirit to the heavy ball idea. It even has similar convergence results. You can act, there's actually very rich convergence theory associated with conjugate gradient that goes well beyond that heavy ball convergence idea that I sketched from the previous slide. But one of the results from the conjugate gradient literature is that the asymptotic linear convergence rate is exactly the one we just derived for heavy ball. So in that sense, there's even a confluence of the theory as well. But you can actually prove much more about CG. And again, there's some more details in, in chapter five of that book. Okay, so I think this is a good time to break. Um, there's even 10 seconds for questions and then and then we'll have lunch.